epistemology and phenomenology framing. To elaborate on some of the notions outlined above, First, we ought to explore more explicitly the concepts of epistemology and phenomenology and the relationship that exists and persists between these two fields of study. For those who are interested in a more technical and comprehensive account of epistemology than the one provided herein, please refer to my mini lecture entitled On the Scope of Knowledge Properly Speaking. What, then, is epistemology and what is phenomenology? Well, epistemology is defined as the study of knowledge, justification, and the rationality of belief, while phenomenology is defined as the study of the structures of experience of self, also known as the study of phenomena as distinct from that of the nature of being. Epistemology, then, is broadly concerned with how we come to know things and with a definitive account of justification, especially with respect to knowledge. How can one justify that one knows the truth of some proposition? What are the conditions for legitimate knowledge? Phenomenology, on the other hand, is concerned with experience as such, which is to say that it is concerned with the facts of experience as they appear in the experience itself, rather than the facts of experience as they appear within a logical or rational framework that contextualizes them properly, so to speak. Already, the cleavage between these two notions should become quite apparent. Epistemology concerns the structural relation that must hold between interpretation and justification in order to constitute knowledge of some subject matter, such as the nature of some experience. While phenomenology focuses on the facts of experience prior to conscious interpretation and justification both. This may, however, prove to be a, mis a misleading division, as the epistemological skill set operating in the individual is indeed brought to bear within their phenomenology, but implicitly so. What I mean by this is that one's epistemological precepts form a critical part of the frame one applies to their experience, and that this frame is projected subconsciously onto those facts of experience in order to render them as something intelligible to the individual. Hence, the stronger the implicit epistemology, the more rigidly is one's experience constrained by the limitations unconsciously projected. While conversely, the more articulate the epistemology, the more one can instantiate degrees of freedom for the phenomenology. That is, the more fluid can one's phenomenology be. In other words, a strong implicit epistemology leads to narrow-minded accuracy and typically justified confidence in said accuracy, while a strong explicit epistemology leads to a sweeping accuracy that doubts its own confidence while nonetheless being confident in the tendency to be correct despite the self-doubt. In short, an implicit epistemology has a severely and unconsciously limited scope in comparison to an explicit epistemology, a narrowness that is manifest phenomenologically. Here, strong and weak refer to different levels of proficiency with respect to epistemological activity. To reiterate the crucial point, One's epistemological presuppositions heavily constrain what kind of phenomena they will recognize as meaningful, and therefore what phenomena they will recognize full stop, and consequently they have a direct influence on the manifestation of phenomenal experiences, as one's epistemology serves as an implicit filter for what one is willing to explore in contrast with what one deems to be a mere artifact of the imperfect nature of human perception and investigation. 
One's epistemology also informs how one reacts to arguments and propositions which contradict one's own phenomenal experiences of the world, such that a strong epistemology enables the individual to consider the alien and often contrary experience as equally valid, and seek to discover what common ground exists prior to the divergence in interpretation while a weak epistemology is more likely to simply reject or dismiss experiences that are contrary to one's own with little to no exploration of what led the other person to believe what they did. Epistemology, therefore, is an implicit perceptual or phenomenological frame. Unfortunately, a direct consequence of this framing relation that epistemology has with phenomenology is that when an individual has a strong yet flawed implicit epistemology, it is very difficult, nigh on impossible in some cases, for them to see the limitations of their perspective. This is so precisely because they are quite good at it normally, and so believe themselves justified in their level of confidence on the matter, in spite of protest. To elaborate on, upon what I have called a strong epistemology and a weak epistemology, by which I mean to designate, that doesn't, god damn it, <laughs> it's a little awkward, by which I mean to designate the set of skills involved in productive epistemological activity. Oh. These terms, I must warn you, are entirely of my own construction and are intended to simplify some of the nuance in the field so as to render it workable for the purposes of the lecture. Most individuals don't have time for comprehensive explorations of epistemology. However, a brief overview is pertinent to the discussion of the signal noise problem. If one possesses what I would call a weak epistemology, the best solution for strengthening it is to attempt to articulate it. An epistemology does not need to be consciously articulated to be optimally strong, but in the event that it is not already optimal, exposition is thereby the only route by which the insufficiency could be made apparent. The most basic of all epistemological invocations is popularly paraphrased as, all I know is that I know nothing, which is an explicit though paradoxical articulation of the recognition that one ought not to claim to know when they do not. This caution around erroneous claims to knowledge is an essential element of the epistemic humility in recognition of which Socrates was crowned the wisest man in Athens by the oracle at Delphi. This humility is, in effect, a capacity to recognize the limitations of subjective perception and a willingness to admit, when a demonstration has been made, that one lacks the grounds to claim knowledge on a particular subject. Consequently, this basic humility is the seed of all epistemological skill. If cultivated, it can grow into a certain proficiency in, in precisely qualifying propositions, in other words, designating the limitations of an assertion or inference, as well as a comprehensive capacity for specifying the available grounds for doubting a particular justification or explanation. This cultivated seed also confers the ability to excavate assumptions and presuppositions, combined with a capacity to explicate relevant implications of an analytical proposition. What has just been described is what I would call a strong epistemology, while in contrast a weak epistemology is one which tends to conflate concepts in close perceptual proximity, such as appearance and reality, opinion and truth, and so on and which tends to be somewhat indiscriminate in believing things which cohere with one's preconceptions, even if not well justified. A weak epistemology will, in addition, tend to manifest itself as a blindness to one's own presuppositions and a noticeable lack of grace in analysis and definition of terms. And finally, the most obvious difference between the two is that a strong epistemology will be conducive to a general tendency to admit that one could be wrong, while someone with a weak epistemology will be reticent to admit to this possibility. Let us now attempt to make clear the distinction between an epistemological prejudice 
one which values one which evaluates whether some interpretation is pro properly justified although values actually fits quite well as well <clears throat> and a phenomenological one which focuses entirely upon the facts of experience without regard for the validity of the interpretation being applied thus let us imagine that we meet an old lady who tells us that she has tea with jesus every friday at noon those among us who are prejudiced towards epistemology, if they concern themselves with the story at all, will analyze the premises given and inferences drawn, critiquing the interpretation and providing plausible alternative explanations for the set of reasons given. Those among us who have a prejudice towards phenomenology, on the other hand, will be concerned with precisely what this old lady is experiencing that leads her to believe such a thing. What does she think is happening, and what are the actual facts of her experience that she is interpreting? In other words, epistemology focuses on the why and how of the interpretation, while phenomenology focuses on the who, what, when, and where of the event that is to be analysed. The significance of this distinction lies in the form of the alchemical secret, which concerns the manifestation within the individual of a maximally fluid phenomenology paired with a rigid epistemology. In other words, the secret to alchemy lies in the cultivation of a rigid and therefore analytically rigorous epistemological skill set which does not unduly constrain the realm of phenomenological experience. Remember this. To summarize the previous two sections, let me say simply this. The epistemological pendulum swim, swings back and forth such that at first one is where one thinks they know, and then, out of nowhere almost, one finds that one is where they know that they do not know. That is, they realize that the complexity of the world is beyond the somewhat arbitrarily imposed limitations of the system of language that they are currently employing to map the problem space. We think we know, then we know that we don't. And on it goes. Hey guys, uh, thanks for watching the lecture. I just wanted to let you know that I recently made my Patreon live. So you can now follow me on there. Um, the link will be in the description and also I'll post a link in the video. Um, also, I was just wanted to encourage you to subscribe and check out my other work, also linked in the description.